best job at this conference. You know, when you go to conferences, people will often say something like, well, this next speaker requires no introduction. Well, in this case, it couldn't be truer. 250 million followers. But you know, I know how anxious everyone is to meet Kim Kardashian West. So without any waste, even of a nanosecond, I want to introduce you to Mrs. Kim Kardashian West.
figure it out as you go. It's kind of like when you're a new mom and you think you're just supposed to have it all figured out and you just are winging it. You're figuring it out as you go. And it doesn't mean that you're less of a successful person because you were figuring it out as you go. I think that's everyone in life. A lot of startups use the word pivoting. And in technology world, we use the word pivoting all the time, maybe overused. But it's exactly what you're talking about, where you try something, and if it doesn't work, you try another version. And if that doesn't work, you try a third time. But what it takes is resilience. What it takes is the opportunity to hang in there, not give up. And that's a great message, I think, for all of us, but especially women, because I think women are more perfectionists than men are. Um, I don't know if you know my husband. That, that would be the truest statement. But yes, I, I totally, um, I believe that as long as you learn from every step of the way and every mistake or every success, everything that you do, as long as it's a part of your story and as long as you learn from it, you're doing the right thing. In the technology world, we also use another term very often, and that's transparency. And I really do think that uh, Kim Kardashian West has defined the term transparency. You are willing to open up your life and basically be on camera, share a lot of your personal life. How do you balance that? How do you balance privacy with, in fact, allowing the world to see what, how you live and how you conduct your day-to-day -day life? I think at the beginning, I didn't even know what the word privacy really meant. I was very okay with people knowing every detail of my life. As you get a little bit older and you have kids and you realize you do want to value some privacy, I figured out a really good balance of sharing what I want to share. I think, you know, you can, there, there definitely is oversharing, um, especially when safety can be a factor and, and it, can, it can, you know, when there's so many eyes on you. Um, I learned firsthand that if you share too much, it could be a little bit dangerous at times. And so I was really cautious and I, I move really cautiously now that I have kids but I still love to be open and honest, and that's who I am, and that's my brand. And there's just, there is a way to have both and to share, but not feel like your whole life has been, about, you know, or, or is being used just for social media. You do have to have balance. Absolutely, I agree. Um, I want to switch and talk about what you and I discussed yesterday, and that is how do you decide? to bring out another product. You have had this amazing franchise for um, multiple years now. Today you have 250 million followers and your followers are not slowing down. In fact, if anything, they're growing. So how do you keep your franchise going? How do you keep your brand going? And most importantly, when you're bringing out a new product, how involved do you get? So every product that I, like if we're just talking beauty and, and fragrance and, um, <clears throat> and shapewear, those are the companies that I own, they're not licensing deals. Um, so I'm involved every step of the way, from the packaging to the logo design to pretty much everything. That's a lot of detail, so you don't delegate the um the pieces like a logo design or a color to others, do you actually oversee that? Make not on any visual. Yeah, the visual aspect of it, I like to oversee it all. Shapewear would be maybe a little bit different because if we go into retail, <clears throat> I, I'm not, I, you know, there's other people that would do that it's instead, so I won't handle all of those relationships, but what I've found is every time there's a product that I want to release, I mean, it just, it works when it's super authentic to you. If you love something so much or if you're really good at something, so for me, shapewear, I feel like I've 
been creating my own shapewear for over a decade. With beauty, um, you know, I feel like I, you know, got my first makeup lesson when I was 14 years old. And so every time I want to put out a product, I just have to make sure that it's super authentic and really thought out. And I, I do it every, every step of the way, from the press box that we deliver, to all the influencers, to the campaign, to the photographer. The look and feel of everything is me. Uh, but it's not just physical world products that you have. You actually rolled out a game, um, and it's been a digital product that's been going on for, what, five years now? A little over five years now. And um, the character seems to follow you, actually. So tell me about that. How, how involved are you with the computer game? And understanding that most games have a shelf life of about 18 months, you have yours going for about five years. Yeah, so I'm really proud of Kim Kardashian Hollywood. It was really my first tech venture. A tech company approached me in Silicon Valley. <laughs> And I was actually unsure at first. Do I want to do a video game? How would, how would I make that authentic to me? Because when you think of a celebrity in a video game, you think of more like a basketball game or some, something related to sports. So the concept was really cute. And the fact that I would have a really big say in what my character would do and wear and a lot of it, it's called Kim Kardashian Hollywood, and, and a lot of it <clears throat> has to do with the clothes that the character is wearing and buying and photo shoots and everything in Hollywood. So I think it's maintained its success due to just being so involved, you know? I think a lot of times, you know, I, I can't speak for anyone that I personally know, but when you hear of all these deals and these deals that especially celebrities do, they sometimes just put their name on it. And, and forget about it. Yeah. And you stay current and you keep it current so that actually the game is a reflection of you, it sounds like. Um, I'm going to switch the topic to a different area now. And that is the, I think, quarter of a billion people. Is that right? Following you? When you go to bed at night, do you think about that? Because, I mean, the population of multi many countries in the world is, are not as large as your followers. So when you go home and, and are going to bed, do you say, like... Now the pressure now has a bed in my head. Yeah, how... Uh, well, last night, I woke up at midnight being so jet lagged and my daughter wanted to have a dance party and so it's two in the morning and she's asking me to video her to send it to her best friend to show her new dance moves and so she said did you post that did you post it and just the the thought of just it's really fascinating I mean it's obviously there's so many benefits and then there's you know, some negativity as well, but just the fact that social media has evolved so much is, is fascinating to me, that I could easily post my dance party in the middle of the night. I'm the worst dancer, so you would not want to see this dance party on my phone. But just to know that that's even a possibility really blows my mind sometimes. And oh, I, so I do, I am mindful of it. Yes, and what social media has really done is really flattened the world, right? Geography no longer matters. You can be accessing people in every time zone. So when it's midnight here in Armenia, it's actually daytime in the United States. So the reach of social media is incredibly powerful. And you really have learned, I think, over time to take advantage of that and really use it cautiously. Um, are you a numbers person? Do you worry about your followers potentially, you know, leveling off? And how often do you check the numbers? So I'm not the biggest numbers person on social media. I have realized that that I am really mindful of not getting too worked up over it because I, I do understand that's not the healthiest thing. 
is to worry about likes and engagement that way. I'm a numbers person when it comes to business and launches. I'm always available launch day to be on my Shopify account and seeing what's selling, what's not, um, just all about all the customers. I'm a numbers person in that way because I'm, I just care so much. I really want to know how a launch is going. I'm very involved that way. Um, yesterday when we were together, you talked about a launch um, in makeup, actually. That didn't go as well as you wanted. Uh, partly, you were saying it was because it wasn't really as authentic of what you use. Can you tell us more about that? That's a product that was not as satisfactory to you at launch. Yeah, so um, I always like to do analysis of everything that I am launching, and I'm extremely, I feel like every launch to me is really emotional. I spend time to think about the concept and the photo shoot, and because my brand is primarily direct-to-consumer, I feel like I have a huge responsibility to come up with the perfect campaign to the perfect product. And so sometimes, you know, the makeup that I wear is very neutral, and I'm kind of known for wearing a nude lip all the time, and a more simple eye makeup, or, you know, the very specific colors, I don't really veer off of that. So when I try to do something, because I really want to, I think it's fun, and I want to do a bright color, it might not sell as well because it's just not what people see me in all the time. So I am really mindful of that going forward. I, I, I don't really get that upset about it. I just move forward. I figure out why it's not working and figure out what really does work and move on. Um, I'm sure everyone in the audience would like to hear how often um, do you launch a new product? And how much homework do you do? How much market research do you do, in fact, before you launch a new product? So I think, um, well, I try to launch a new product monthly. <clears throat> monthly. And with fragrance and makeup and shapewear, I try to map it all out. Sometimes it'll be two products with different companies a month. But so for market research, I really, Sometimes it's good to see what's out there in the marketplace, but sometimes it's not beneficial to look to the right or look to the left all the time. If you just stay focused and look straight and do what you want to do, I have found that when I try to keep up with the trends, like do a trendy color, it hasn't served me as well. So, but how about market research with your fans, your followers? You have this amazing access to them. Basically, you have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram that you can reach them. Um, do you take advantage of like a focus group, a virtual focus group? I absolutely do. That's the best part. That's what I think got me hooked to Twitter and really shaped my brand because when I was launching, <clears throat> sorry, my first fragrance, I tweeted, should I use this color pink, like a lighter pink or a darker pink? And I really did listen to the advice of what everyone was tweeting back to me. And I think that shaped a huge part of my brand because I realized how important the fan base was and that is who my brand is. I wanted to make products for them. And so I think ever since then, we've become this like unit together making little drops of products that I really believe that they want. Yeah, and uh, in the world of technology, usually we use the word user base versus followers, but it's really the same thing. I mean, you're taking advantage of having access to your user base and taking their input, basically, seeking their input first, and then taking their input as you shape um, your new products. But the cadence of launching new products seems incredibly fast-paced, uh, bringing out something new in such, you know, successive order. I do plan out really far in advance, though. How so far? About a year. I have my yearly calendar. I, I just, you know, sometimes it can be so last minute, and because it just clicks and it's right, and sometimes 
it's super planned out, but I try to be as planned out as possible. And so do you, is, is the yearly calendar, let's say, taking off um, in January, putting that together, and who are some of your most go-to, you know, confidants, if you may, or collaborators, your executive staff in planning that um, calendar with you? Yeah, so I have a, a really small staff of about four people, maybe five, and we work really well together. We love, I love to have a meeting, you know, once a week with everybody and all of our boards up. Are they like Monday morning meetings or how do you conduct that? It depends on traveling and where I'm at. I mean, I'm in the office, I, I definitely go once a day. It's right down the street, so I'm definitely there. But I love to have meetings at my house and just after I come back from a trip, I, I was super inspired by things that I saw here in Armenia, so I'll go back with some new ideas. I thought of like four ideas that I'm excited about. But I love to travel. And also, when I can't think of ideas and when I feel like, what am I going to put on that calendar for a next launch and I can't think of anything, I love to travel. And I get so many ideas traveling. Uh, would you mind sharing some of the ideas you said uh, that, you know, your, your time here in Armenia inspired you? Just give us that little peek into your thinking. Uh, I thought of a good fragrance. There was, um, oh, I don't want to give it away. So I, have to to, I, don't, I don't want you to. I don't want yeah. you to. But, I, but just give us categories at least. I think something in beauty something something major in beauty that I what do you mean major just a major idea something I haven't done before that I was inspired by yesterday just driving down the streets of Armenia and then I think a, a fragrance I would love to do with some beautiful fragrant Armenian flowers. Sounds lovely. Okay, we will be waiting for that. We'll be following you and, and looking for the launch. Um, Jim, I love you! <laughs> I love you! Well, we're going to continue to have Kim when we're done with the fireside chat because Kim is also joining the panel that we're going to move on to. But before we do that, I um, want to basically ask you specifically about vegan Armenia, which we just talked about, but also being at a tech conference in Armenia. How does that make you feel? Well, I couldn't be more proud. I, I had to bring my kids because just being in Armenia, I've been once before, but being able to bring my sister Courtney, who had never been here before, and all of our children, and getting, getting the opportunity to baptize them all yesterday here in Armenia. We'll have these memories forever. Um, so that, just on a personal trip, that means everything. We're filming my TV show here today and on this trip, so I love being able to even use some local um, Armenian people here to help coordinate our trip and get it all situated. So, um, I mean, that in itself just means everything to me to be here. When I heard they were holding the tech conference in Armenia, I mean, it wasn't even, I couldn't say yes fast enough. It was the best, Wonderful. you know, excuse to come here again. So thank you for having me. And I'm just so proud there's a huge tech conference. People. Um, back at home, I think I was telling you this yesterday, um, someone that w works for me went to go buy something at, at Nordstrom's and said, oh, I need this bag because I'm traveling, and the girl that worked there said, well, where are you going? And she said, oh, Armenia. And the girl that worked there said, I'm Armenian. I, there's this huge tech conference in Yerevan, and, and everyone's going, and they have all these, you know, so exciting for our country and I was so excited that just people around the world are so excited 
to be here and that a huge tech conference like this is happening in our media. So thank you for having me. I'm so I just want to say, Kim, that I am full-blooded Armenian. I grew up in Istanbul, Turkey, and lived there until I went to college. And when I went to the United States, I was trying to, you know, talk about this region and talk about Armenia. I would tell my best friends about the food and about the culture. And, you know, it would go in one ear out the other. They didn't really remember much until you came to Armenia in 2015. And then all of a sudden, my friends were quoting me facts about Armenia, the ones that hadn't even paid attention to me. So thank you for what you do, for your culture, for Armenia. And now, now it's time we're going to remain seated, but they are going to bring additional chairs for the rest of the panel. And um, when the chairs are situated, we're going to move to the end, and I'm going to invite the other panelists. Hi, I'm Actually, just, Monty. Hi, hi. Sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you very much. And a round of applause, please, to Magdalena for an amazing interview. Thank you. I was going to get some chairs, going to bring up three more amazing panelists. So just sit tight. We'll do it as quickly as we can. Stay where you are. And in the meantime, Kim, I'm going to give you a copy of Power Up. But funding, funding member of Salesforce, uh, that's you, sorry. Um, I'll go start again. Avoyan Hovannis, the founder of Pixar. as an entrepreneur. Now, Pixar is one of the top most downloaded apps in the world. And if by five years ago I was dreaming about being the best photo editor on mobile, I think we are there now. the most downloaded photo editor on mobile. And my next dream is to reach a billion people on Pixar. That's a great dream. Um, Alex? Thanks for having me. Uh, your fun's been so much for me. It's all over here. I really appreciate it. So I'm the founder of Giphy. If you've ever sent a GIF in your life, it's most likely to be We are now uh, the, the second largest search engine behind Google. We, we serve almost a billion people a day, about 10 billion people. Uh, before that, though, I was in a, a lot of you are engineers. There's a lot of good engineering crew here so, uh, in Yerevan. So before that, I was an engineer. 
and after being an engineer for a while and not looking cool, I went back to art school, went to fashion school and dropped out, and then went to two different art schools, got to New York. We actually, I actually went to White Combinator with Alexis like 10 years ago. Don't, don't dance like that. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. It was a minute ago. That was a really, really long time ago. Uh, and I've been doing, this is my 12th startup, I've been doing this for the last 25 years. Is. Probably a few red news out here. Uh, I started Reddit right out of the school, right on. Uh, and I, I, you know, actually, we sold it early. Uh, and then in 2010, I needed to get away from the Silicon Valley bubble. And I came here and lived in Armenia for four months. And that was my first trip here, and I was ashamed it took me that long. But I was grateful that I did, and in all the years that I keep coming back, I continue to be more impressed, more excited, more hyped. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very happy to be here. And uh, Well, all of you are um, multiple time entrepreneurs. You've all started multiple companies. But what I would like to ask first um, is the current company that you've just started. Give me, if you wouldn't mind, and our audience, the origin story. Why are you doing what you're doing? Kim, in your case, it's your shapewear product. Yes, I started a company called Skims, and it is shapewear lingerie for all women. I want it to be extremely inclusive. Um, usually shapewear, for me, the reason I wanted to start it was because there were a lot of styles out there that I had never seen before and skin tone colors that didn't exist for even my skin tone. Usually shapewear comes in one or two colors of really pale color and black. And so I would always take my shapewear and dye it with tea bags and try to get a, a skin tone a little bit similar to mine. So I launched Skims a few months ago with nine different shades and completely seamless, which I hadn't seen before. Uh, so I basically like to take something that I am looking for, that I believe me and all my friends and sisters find as a necessity and try to figure out how to make the best version of that. Thank you very much. And who on this? Pixar, you started how many years ago? Tell us the origin story of that. We started, you know, Pixar was live in 2011, and I was in the process of selling my previous company, and I saw my daughter crying. And the reason she was crying, she was 10 years old, and she shared one of her drawings in one of the social networks, and get very nasty comments, and she was completely shocked. So it was kind of like father feeling about, like feeling a pain for your daughter. And, uh, and I want to do something. I want to you know, create a, uh, something for people like her to be not only creative, but be also in a positive environment. To be surrounded by other people like her. And that's why the, all the philosophy of Pixar is, first of all, to lower the barrier of, barriers of creativity, make it available to everyone. And second, to create a very welcoming community where people are sharing and enjoying to do art together. Thank you. Sounds fantastic. So if you guys see a little girl crying next, you know where to direct that child. Uh, Alex, tell us, you are so many companies uh, in your past. Tell us why you started Giffy. So, so Giffy, just like Kim, was just a project I did for my friends. Because there was no place to find gifts and send them to your friends. And there, yeah, Google actually hadn't done that at the time either. And it, it started from a weird co philosophical conversation about language and how, you know, we only have a couple words for love in every language. There's maybe one emoji, but there's a million different ways to express it. And there's no way to actually send or communicate all those different types of expression to people. So we, we, we came up with, with this idea of an expression search engine. Uh, somewhere, somewhere to catalog all of the human expression in the world and be able to take that from pop culture and, and media and then be able to send it to your friends or family or anyone to express exactly what type of love or feelings that you have, that you're thinking that words just aren't available to do, especially across culture. My, my mom doesn't speak English, so trying to communicate 
like the crazy frustration she has in Korean to me is like very, very difficult. Uh, so, you know, we, we ended up building this engine and then the whole goal from the, 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 set, the, the beginning was to see if, could we compete with Google from search? And when we looked at Google, Google actually only searches about 5% of all the possible words in the dictionary. But all of the other words about love, happy, hungry, excited, all of the words that are actually hu words about humanity are things that no one searches Google for. And, there, and we knew that there had to be a search engine that was really not organizing the world's information, but organizing the world's expression and culture. That's, that was the mission of the company. And now, you know, now after seven years, we're the second largest search engine. Right That's now. pretty phenomenal. And I actually didn't know that, so thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so Alexis, you've done a lot of things in your life, and you are choosing to do something very different this time around. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, it really was my experience with Reddit that helped guide why uh, my, my co-founder, Gary Tan, and I created Initialized, uh, which is an early stage venture capital firm. Um, basically, we were really lucky because in 2005, someone took a chance on a couple of college kids who didn't have any experience or any qualifications. Um, the last thing of, basically, I was preparing to be a lawyer, and I walked out of an LSAT uh, to go get breakfast one morning and realized if I didn't want to take this really important test and instead would rather just get some waffles, I probably shouldn't be a lawyer. So I was, I was pretty anxious <laughs> early, at the time. Early warning you had. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, it, was, it was fortuitous because it forced me to figure out, like, all right, what can I do? And, and, and I was a good enough programmer that I could start building. Um, but I didn't have the credentials. I had no business experience whatsoever aside from working at a pizza hut in a parking garage. And so uh, I got a $12,000 check that changed everything. And so the way we want Initialized to thrive is by being willing to have the courage to be the first investors in a company, even when it's just a couple of relatively underqualified founders, um, but who have big ambitions and have demonstrated ability to execute on them. And, uh, and it's something I actually realized while I was on my paternity leave. I took four months off uh, to just be a dad uh, and do dad things. And frankly, uh, <laughs> during that time, I realized I wanted to have really good dinner table stories. Um, because at the time before that, I'd gone back to Reddit to help lead the turnaround. Um, <laughs> I work with a company now of like 450 people, which is still pales in comparison to the ones next to me. But even that size wasn't about real work anymore. It was just about executive therapy sessions. And, and I wanted to get closer to solving real problems so that I could come home from work every day and not tell my daughter about like, navigating between a, a, helping a GC talk to our COO, um, but instead about the great entrepreneurs that I got to meet. And, uh, and there's plenty, there's plenty right here in the audience, I'm sure. That's fantastic. Um, Alex, you just said something that really struck me, and that is, if I heard you correctly, you said your mom doesn't really speak English. And one of the issues for the technology companies has been localization. You know, before, um, we had to localize our software to be able to reach the world. But now that we have moved to images, a lot more expressive images that tell stories, we actually have an opportunity to reach the world. Can you elaborate a little bit on this whole concept of your mom wanting to express her frustrations with you and the tools you created for her? Uh, I actually have most of my friends' moms now send me random gifts. And you'll get this random gift that and you had no idea that they were that funny or they were that weird. And they will spend hours searching for this thing to represent themselves. People, they don't really have the words. My mom, she, my mom's a painter uh, and she was educated, but when she moved here, uh, when she was 30 years old, she, to the United States, not our media, that would have been cool. Uh, <laughs> And I was thinking of using she, she didn't have the vocabulary of which to talk to people. And just even being able to, to say a few words. So everyone just kind of considered her to be you know, a, a 10 year old kid. And, and I remember when I was, I moved here when I was five uh, to the United States, that is. And learning English was, it was really hard. And then what we we're seeing is all of these people, the, the, the expressions they have, the ability, because cinema is pretty universal now. Like, uh, even uh, you know, Parasite now is a Korean film that's just one uh, at Cannes. That, that 20 years ago would never have been the case, right? Korean cinema was like not a, even a thing. There wasn't enough distribution. So we're in an era now where 
the tools, the creative tools are available to anyone to create content. The distribution is available to everyone. And now people can, now what we're seeing is our people can use these, this content to express themselves all over to each other. And that is something that my mom has never been had access to. So, you know, every day we, we have about hundreds of millions of people expressing different types of emotions to people all over the world. So I, I do think we're just starting, you know, the, the second thing that you ever say in a conversation after hello is, how are you? But to answer that in different languages is really difficult. Answering that from my mom's point of view, she has like two words to express that even though there's a million different ways to do that. Now she has tools, and a lot of what Pixar and other companies are doing to, to, to express what she's feeling. Yeah, thank you, and I think I totally agree. I think that this whole concept of not being able to express emotion in words, you know, I, English is actually my fourth language. I started out with Armenian, Turkish, French, English, and I had those very same frustrations. Um, you know, there are a lot of words that I just can't even find in English after, you know, knowing English for 40 plus, 45 years now. Hobanis, you also are in the world of pictures. Tell us about how your user base um, actually uses Pixar to express emotion. Right, so, uh, also I know like three languages, a little less like you. I know Armenian, Russian, and English. But believe me, there are more countries in the world that understand these languages. And you, when you go to these countries where people didn't understand your language, what do you, what do, you do? You use your body language. So, it's the, you, you, you need food, you say, I need food, right? And you want to check, you say, try to check. Right? And everybody understands that because it's a very universal language. Uh, people use images and visual stories to communicate since like uh, caves, ages, and uh, we don't, we don't, we have kind of, we have an our DNA to communicate through images. Uh, what we do at Pixar, we really empower everyone to create a visual story. Making visual story is a very fundamental skill, which is kind of, we have in our DNA to do that. When we are kids, we do lots of uh, creativity, and uh, we, we want to provide Fun tools, not only just powerful tools, but fun tools for people to not only uh, create but also have fun with creating that and have a lot of practice and gamified experience versus work like six month courses on uh, for Photoshop, enjoy and do it for fun and learn skills and then use the storytelling in your personal or business life. Yeah, thank you. Kim, when we were doing the fireside chat, you talked about how important image is for your new product rollouts, for your products, and actually how personally you get involved with the image, with the logo, with the colors, etc. So you obviously agree with the panelists that, in fact, visual is really important. Has there been a visual that you really feel uh, really made a big difference that you worked on? And if not, just tell us, how do you, how do you actually decide what visual to go with? Um, well, I, I, obviously, I think a huge part of my career has been image. And through social media apps, you know, I use Pixar, I use GIFs, I mean, I think if you're in the social media world and you have a brand that really is, especially my brand, relies a lot on me. So it is, there is a lot of pressure to find the right expression to, you know, for me, in, in my case, let's talk about maybe skins. I wanted the brand to be really known for inclusivity and so to find the perfect photographer to get the perfect to capture the perfect emotion of what I wanted to say, that first time out to the world that I presented it on Instagram was really kind of the, your make it or break it. To me, I think the first impression is really important and you have to really take the time to figure out what you want that brand to be. And like I said, my team's a really small team. It's about four or five people and we come up with every idea really Ourselves, we don't outsource any agencies, so we understand that image is really everything, but we rely on inspiration from maybe gifts that we see or edits that we see or 
you know, even like I was mentioning earlier, just traveling around the world to get different perspectives on images. So I, images are extremely important, and I take them extremely seriously. You know, when I post things on Instagram, I'm very mindful of what I post and what image it is, whether I you know, use an app to express that, or, you know, a, an editing image app to express that. I think um, if you are very serious about your brand, you have to be extremely serious about the images that you put out. Because we live in such a visual world these days. Alexis, now you are a venture capitalist investor, so you look at a lot of different companies. And um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the next wave is going to be on image tools? Well, I, I agree with all the panelists here. We live in this visual age. Actually, I remember being a kid in grade school looking and learning about like Egyptian hieroglyphics and thinking like, how do they communicate all of that with just a few symbols? And now I see a GIF and it can tell an entire story, an emoji can tell an entire story, and it's like, oh, okay, so this makes a lot more sense now. The, I, I really think we've reached a kind of um, uh, sort of peak social, I think the reason we're seeing a proliferation of more community-driven apps uh, is because we've all kind of reached the saturation point in a lot of ways. We're going to look for networks. I mean, not unlike your daughter crying because of the, the commentary she got. I think we've all now got social media ubiquity, and the platforms that get me most excited, the ones that I think are going to grow the most in the next 10 years, are actually ones that give us a sense of community a shared space for whether that is, whether that's talking about our favorite sports team or, or, or creating art together. I think that's where all of this goes. And, and I do think the format is gonna be very visual, whether it is images or moving images, video. Um, that's absolutely where it's at. And, and don't even get me started, as, as 5G rolls out, that just becomes a no-brainer because we'll have so much bandwidth wherever we go for whatever videos or, or live content we want. Just Thank you. Um, earlier in the fireside chat, Kim and I talked about growing a user base, uh, growing a follower, follower base. Um, I wanted to hear from you guys as to what are some of the user acquisition strategies that you feel um, are going to actually make a difference going forward. As an investor, one of the worries that I used to have when I was a venture capitalist was I didn't want to invest in a company for all that money to go to Facebook and Google, right? I mean, I wanted to have my dollars that got invested to be used in a more, much more efficient way. So, yet we live with our user acquisition numbers, our monthly active users, et cetera. So, so what's the, what, as an entrepreneur founder, what are your tools? What do you have or what would you like to have to be able to grow your user base or your you know, follower base? Yeah. So as a startup, as a, especially when you're in an early stage of your startup, Acquiring first users are super important because later on you can learn, you can have data, you can optimize, but you need first users. And to get these first users, we, I mean, almost every startup I know they use different growth hacking tactics. Uh, I can tell you one of the funny stories of our early growth hacking we have. Uh, we were, if you remember Android, uh, there was a very early Android store they have a section called recent uh, apps or updates. And in order to get to the top of the list, uh, you need to submit your app Friday midnight, basically, and then you get a very high chance to be on the top of the list. So you stay there for a very, I mean, almost a week, like on top of the list. So we decided to do like release every week, and we stay like nights, just to make this sharp deadline to deliver our app by Friday night. So you'd hack the system? Yeah, we hack the system, yes. It's not possible anymore, they take this hour down, but that was like growth hacking tactics we have. And there are lots of things you do when you are early and you don't have money and budget to do more expensive marketing. Uh, and that's why, you know, that's why we, we get our early customers, our users. Thank you. Any more comments? I'm just gonna add to what 
what to say earlier. We, we know that about two years ago, time spent on messaging past time spent on social, meaning most of the social platforms are in decline and messaging is now kicking off. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg even said that in 2017. He, he said all of the growth on Facebook is going to be in private stories and messaging. So that's where everybody is right now. It, and that's a good thing, I think, because social media was supposed to be about bringing people t towards conversation, bringing community. And it quickly like became not that, right? And what we're seeing is messaging now is where people are having conversations. And more people having conversations, like on Twitter, on Instagram, everywhere. I think one of the cool things about Kim's platform is she'll put a post out, and that's cool, it's good content, but really the, the from a technology point of view and from what I'm doing, seeing the million people having a conversation and millions of different parts of conversations about totally random things, she is a catalyst for this entire community to talk about every aspect of their lives. And that, I think, is the future, and that's where, you know, when we talk about user acquisition, you have to go where people are. People are really in messaging and, and conversations, and if you can build products around that, that builds better community, that lets people talk to each other more effectively, that helps a lot of the problems that social media has brought onto the world today. So thank you, yeah, taking advantage of basically the, the conversation that actually users start amongst themselves. Yes, Alexis? Mildly growth hack, some of you may know this. In 2005, when we were starting out, because Reddit is all usernames, if you saw any of the posts in the first like four months of Reddit, even though it looked like a bunch of different people, it was just me. <laughs> uh, with different usernames. Uh, so I was like, wait. Now he tells are you applying for the comments of the hack? Or, uh, all right, well, they, they're not fake anymore. They're all, they're, they're mostly real now. Um, <laughs> But, but I will also, because of what Alex said, it just underscores a bigger point, which is the genius of what you've done, Kim, is you and, and a few others have actually started to get some of the value back that you've given platforms like Instagram. And the reality is there's still, there's so much that's locked in there that you and your community are responsible for that I think it's gonna be interesting to see in the next 10 years as that evolves, because that's, that's real value, that, that community and being able to activate it is what is bringing so much value to these platforms that aren't doing a very good job managing it. And so I know Zuck and others are trying to find a way to evolve, but uh, I'm, I'm much, I'm longer on the people who actually have the community because you can bring them with you to new platforms as they emerge. Alex is so on the door. <laughs>
might stumble across my product or get, you know, get it as a gift and then they genuinely love the product and become how they discover it. Yeah, it makes me really happy when I hear different stories of people just really enjoying the product, maybe not even knowing that I'm attached to the product. That's fantastic. Um, any other ideas on monetization? Alexis, you're the venture capitalist, so you are watching how actually entrepreneurs can monetize their ideas. I, I think it's interesting. There's few, so, so few, few platforms really get to scale unless the people who run and own those platforms deeply understand their users and know when it is too much and, and, and when is it time to ask. And there are, I think we're seeing more and more creative ways to bring money into the conversation that feels communal. Um, a good example, uh, like a, a company like Twitch um, that brought tipping to a Western audience for a live stream is a way for someone who is a streamer, and I'm not an investor, I'm with buddies of Twitch guys, no bias here. Um, they really popularized for Western audiences this idea of, oh look, I'm entertaining you, and, and people will give money in real time simply for the acknowledgement within the tribe, within the community of viewers, that Fluffy Bunny 64 gave $5 to this streamer. And Fluffy Bunny 64 isn't even a government name, I hope, uh, but it still has value and meaning, and they're willing to take hard-earned money give it to a streamer who's there, whether they're playing video games or doing a makeup tutorial, and wanting to demonstrate that and sort of flex their, their kind of generosity in front of the, the community, and everyone is happy about it. The platform is thrilled, Twitch gets a percentage, they're happy. The streamer is happy because it's paying their bills, and they, they, they give a shout out and say, oh, thank you, Fluffy Bunny, appreciate that. And, and Fluffy Bunny is thrilled, and I think, um, we're going to see more and more creative ways to monetize as, as new platforms emerge that, that let everyone win. Um, because, I mean, that's what at the end of the day software and the internet can do really well, is have supply meet demand. Um, Cameo is another one that's just popped up. Um, that's another, again, I have no vested interest in it. But, but they're coming up with really creative models that we never really would have imagined even five or ten years ago because the technology evolves and people are creative. Absolutely. Yeah, there are four fundamental two models where you either provide your product for free and then you monetize using advertisement or you ask your users to pay. And back like early days, uh, advertisement was the most popular one because of Instagram and Facebook. You know, so there was a venture capitalist who wants to have a, like large scale apps with a, more, a free and monetized through the advertisement. I see, like, last two years, there is a fundamental change in that model. And today, uh, we see more and more successes on a subscription model. So uh, apps like us and uh, our competitors, and mostly in our segment, start monetizing uh, by providing some premium features on top of the free. Uh, on top, we provide lots of basic and free features. We start monetizing by providing some premium uh, tools on top. I believe in the long term it's good for end users because when you do advertisement business, your customer is not with advertisers, they're another company, not the user. You're thinking about them, not our users. When you do subscription business, you think about your business first because you want to provide value. The value when users are really, really, really ready to pay. So that is uh, long term, I think, although we are asking users to pay, but they will benefit more because they will get better product. Absolutely. I think when someone is willing to put their money where their interest is, it shows they get value. And that's exactly what I think happens with your products, Kim. Um, I want to change the discussion now and elevate it and go into some of the headier topics like public policy. Okay? We in the tech world sometimes get a bad name because we're doing what is very fulfilling at the moment, but we are criticized that we don't have a big enough lens in understanding how our technology might affect the future. Um, most technologists really want no government involvement whatsoever. We want to self-monitor. We feel we're smart enough to be able to do that. But I think the last 12 months or last 
months have shown us that that doesn't always work. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on um, you know, self-monitoring of technology companies, especially content producers, like you guys have all been in the content business. You know, how do you do that? Any ideas, Kim or Alexis? Let's start with either one of you. Sure. I think we have, we've seen when it works and when it doesn't. Um, we had our own scandal in 2014. It was the reason I actually came back to lead the turnaround of Reddit because the, the, the then CEO had defended uh, revenge porn. Um, that was the last, that was his last act as CEO um, and we swiftly uh, removed him. Uh, and then we implemented a policy that would say, uh, and couched in the language of, of privacy, um, that we respected the privacy of our users as well as just people of the internet and if non-consensual pornography was posted, we would take it down. Seems like a no-brainer, but until that point, none of the social media platforms actually had a policy in place. And at the time, um, this was becoming a more and more rampant problem, uh, certainly in the US and then probably abroad, um, and states were trying to craft legislation and were trying to do things, because it's, I mean, it's, it's a real issue. Um, and that was one scenario where the platforms took too long but still got their act together and, and now have effectively policed it and, and every platform from Twitter to Google, everyone else followed suit with a similar policy and it's, it's effectively been halted. Uh, and so God forbid if, if one of those photos gets submitted there, it does get taken down um, promptly, immediately, and, and the user is banned, et cetera. Um, and so I think there are instances where we see the, the tech community often too slow, but do a good job policing itself or see it's sort of good enough. Um, but I think the reality of what we've now seen in the last few years is the effect and scale and impact that these platforms have, not just in the U.S., where it definitely does, but also abroad in countries with much less developed media ecosystems is very real. And there is a responsibility that comes with that, um, especially when content is being shared uh, to promote you know, hate or, or worse. And, uh, and so I think this is going to be a very interesting next couple of years in the U.S. I do. I, I, I do believe government has a role, absolutely, in protecting its citizens. I get worried when there aren't technologists in the room to help them craft that, because then they start making decisions that are ostensibly going to do good, but actually end up doing more harm in the long term because of unforeseen consequences. And it's, it's the same reason if you're gonna go into surgery, you wanna talk to as many surgeons as you can, or doctors, before you do it. Uh, likewise, I, I would love to see more technologists at the table when these things are being discussed. And I would like to see less of situations where sitting senators are asking Mark Zuckerberg, what is your business model? Um, because that is dumb. Like, you should have done it. Well, I'm more uh, to know what the business model of Facebook was, for instance. No question about that. I think that was really a very sad moment for the United States Congress. Having said that, I also think that us technologists have the responsibility to educate the lawmakers and make them understand. How much time do you guys, Alex and Havana, spend on actually monitoring content? Uh, quite a bit, actually. So, you know, as a, a, a pretty large search engine, this happened in the first year. And we, took, we have an entire team dedicated to moderation, also editorial, because we would, we would do searches for things like women or men. And if a billion people a month are searching for women on your search engine and looking for visual representation of what women are, you need to be able to represent a worldwide view. So we had an entire team come in, and you know, we made a call as a company not to optimize for click-through rates, so more and more people clicking on things like the way the internet works. And, we had a team that came in and made a very inclusive, diverse, uh, and someone wrote about it, uh, representation of men, women, children, of pretty much every topic that you can see in culture. We, we're not doing the best job yet. I mean, we tried the best, and I think we're better than most everyone on the internet, but the, you know, I think having technologists in the room is great, but we also need cultural philosophers in the room and tech companies. Because we're, we're honestly, we're just making this up. You know, like when, when, we, when people ask, is this a good page that represents the, the term like happy or love? We don't know. You know, like we're, we're just a bunch of engineers trying to figure out this is what 100 million people will send the next hour to represent love to everyone they know. What should those images be? And that's a lot of responsibility we have. 
and it has to be multicultural, it has to be representative of, it can't just be a, you know, a bunch of white dudes representing love to everyone, right? Like, maybe in the sentence will come down. <laughs> but, uh, that, so that, that responsibility falls on us, and we spend a lot, and we spend a lot of time on it. So we, you know, we, in the very beginning, we decided not to have any adult content. We, we wanted to be kids safe, we wanted to be uh, representative of culture, but honestly, it's a very hard problem because we don't, as technologists, we aren't the best people to say what is appropriate for culture, but we actually, governments aren't the best people to say that, that either. We don't actually have experts telling us what we should be doing. Just what you're basically saying is we need more social scientists. We, we do, we need we academics. Need philosophers. In technology, I, I think every startup should have academics, social philosophers that are part of the technology. There should be a new job called chief social officer or something. That is someone that's, and this is, all my PhD friends are like, yes, I need a job. <laughs> but we, we need those people because we're not the best people to be making this policy. Excellent point. Havanas, you live in a world where actually people get to you know, change each other's art. Um, so, in fact, overseeing that becomes even more complicated. Right. right. We have a special form of creativity called remixes when you it's similar to music when you take some, uh, music and then you personalize it and create your own stuff on top of that. And it's, you, you basically own a new form of uh, content. So the same we do with pictures. We allow people to you know, play with pictures and, uh, and it, it's really like it lowers the barriers of, of creativity. Because it's much easier to start with uh, 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 content than with the blank, blank page. I think blank page is the biggest killer for creativity. So we don't want that. Uh, and as you remember, we have uh, the, the, the company started because of my daughter and I really want to be a safe place for people like her. And not only safe, but also positive. Uh, it's, uh, it's the whole sentiment of network should be positive and encouraging. Uh, and going back to your questions about the policy and, uh, and regulations, I think what we really need is, uh, is definitions. Uh, I mean, we don't want to invent our own way of, you know, thinking which is bad or good. Uh, it would be good to have, like, as you said, the social people in the government, maybe, to really understand uh, the social networks and help us to define what is fake news, what is a uh, bad thing, what is a good thing, versus us to decide. We can do that, but sometimes we will be uh, wrong, and if we are wrong, then people will blame us. So we don't want that. We want uh, to have a very with explicit rules, explicit definitions, and then we, can, we can play with that rules. And how often are you actually bringing down content? Oh, we have, a, we have an AI actually, which is doing like 80% of the job, taking like uh, all the pornography and adult content. And then we have moderators, which are monitoring things for by server uh, to make sure there is no any offensive stuff going you know, to the to public. So Kim, on this panel, you probably are the most expert in managing content because you told us that you actually take a personal interest in it. You really believe that it's a reflection of you. You are the actual product, so everything you do is a reflection of you. Um, you also told us that you actually really monitor content. Have there been close calls in your past where you kind of debated with yourself if you should post something or not? I mean, you were giving us a little an example of last night, the dance party uh, in your hotel room, but, but if you could share a little bit more with us. Yeah, well, I also think that the beauty of social media is you get to also be yourself. So there hasn't really been anything that I have posted and thought about it and then deleted it. I'm always pretty confident in my decision of what I'm gonna post. I think that people evolve in life and you know, now that I'm a mom, my choices of what I would post today might not be what I would have posted four years ago. And you know, I think that something that everyone has to be cautious about is that once you do post it, it's posted forever. So, I mean, I definitely have been well aware of, you know, maybe things that I would have posted before that would have been racier than what I would be comfortable posting now. Um, but I still always know that people 
people have phases in their lives, and, the, and if you scroll down, let's just say on Instagram, and you can see where, if, you know, if I'm talking about me in particular, where I might have been at when I started Instagram, to how I got extremely confident, and then I got a little bit sh more shy, and then I can see my moods when I look through my page, and I also think there's beauty in that too, because you can see people's evolutions, you can see, I can see my product evolutions, I can see everything down to like logo details and colors that I maybe would have used before that I wouldn't use now because I, you know, feel like I've evolved in my taste palette or maybe things that nobody would ever even notice because I'm very detail oriented. But I also find, you know, beauty in all of that too that you can look through someone's yearbook of the last however long since they've logged on to social media and see people's personalities and personality changes and growth and there's beauty in all of that too but there is you know a, I, I, I kind of have two different I, I'm not really certain on my opinion of sometimes I feel like there's this pressure to what you should post and censor that because I think you should be who you are and post what you want to post and not feel like there's the pressure of everyone looking, but then I switch and kind of think, okay, well, what would I want my kids to see? And I flip back to, well, there is a responsibility. So um, I don't have a definite answer. I'm no, I think that's a great right answer. And actually, the point you made, it's a, feeling. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of people, I think, um, don't realize the, the permanence of posting on the internet. And I do think that as technologists, we need to actually bring up that education level, especially for the younger people, you know, for your daughter, for, for people who are so excited in the moment and want to communicate their feelings. But it might not be appropriate for them 15, 20 years later. Having said that, maybe it's fantastic to have that level, right? You actually see how you I go back and forth with that, but I, what I think is the most important is how, how you all have expressed seeing comments that have taken you to a place that if you weren't a strong person, they might really affect you, and not everyone. You know, you can see a million comments, and then you'll see one bad comment, and it can ruin your day. So I think it's also letting people express themselves the way that they want to, maybe an expression of photos, but it's teaching people. I mean, the one thing that I try to teach my kids, and it's my most important thing, is just to be kind. And I would never allow someone that I know to speak negatively about someone and leave a nasty comment. So it's also just, I mean, goes back to comment control and figuring out how to not let that negativity in your lives, because there are people and really delicate souls that aren't as strong as, as some people that can handle that. And it's just so unnecessary. It, it really is. Yeah, and especially in the, very good, uh, in the formative years of young people who feel that their net worth is actually derived from the number of likes or the comments. I think that is, again, something that us as technologists can really help educate and uh, maybe even monitor. Um, I'm going to now switch to a totally different kind of conversation. And I'd love, in rapid, you know, whatever way you want to respond, but you know, fairly rapidly, let's start with advice to your younger self. If, since we're on the topic of your younger self, um, it's a question that I get asked very often and sometimes it kind of stops me in my, in my own seat. Uh, but if you could give advice to your younger self, Alexis, what would it be? Uh, keep programming. I would have, I, I would have, I've noticed I was programming in high school and college, but I would have done even more. And I would have, I, I loved my history degree grateful for it. My business degree I could have done without, uh, and I definitely would have studied computer science instead. Uh, and it's the biggest thing. I went to 82 universities after my book came out so that I could go and tell every college student I could that learned
entering the code was the new literacy, and it is the modern superpower, and all of the best tutorials are freely available online, and there has never been a thing this valuable that's also so free to learn. So please, 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 especially because Armenia is, is, is gonna be such a natural place for tech to continue to thrive. Please, you know a little kid, get the code. Send her the tune on. K through 12 chess, like it's in our, it's in our blood, right? It's a, that is such a great foundation for learning to program. Um, but, but that would be the number one advice I'd give myself. And I want to add to that. I want to say that if you're studying computer science, if you're studying electrical engineering or any other kind of engineering, I believe the most important thing is to stay in the program. Do not quit. Do not feel like if you got a C, you should not be in there because you don't have the chops. I think getting those degrees, understanding that the world is really be, being defined by technology, hanging in there, it's totally okay to get a C minus, but graduate. Once you graduate, like I, I went to engineering school, once you graduate, then you can find out that you actually don't want to do engineering and then pay for your own art school. Is that what happened, Alex? Totally. I paid my way through art school because I, uh, you, it's really expensive to go to art school. Uh, but after post-engineering school, uh, engineering is hard. It, but it's really no, gratifying. No question, it's hard. And, but it is super gratifying. I, I mean, I use engineering every day in some way. People don't really realize that graphic design and designing is all, they're all just solving the same problems. It, it's actually the same thing if you've done both of them. You're just taking a problem and solving it. And, Anyone who's doing that in business or engineering, the, the medium is just different. Musicians do that, mathematicians do that. And it's just a way of thinking, so it's more just being educated. Uh, to answer your question of what I would tell myself, I tell myself all the time <laughs> lots of things. But, it, but this is your younger self. Yeah, my, no, yeah, I tell myself my younger self, you shouldn't have done that. Um, but the number one thing I learned was it's just going to be okay. I feel like, especially youth right now, I, I, I have a niece and I have a lot of young friends and. They're so stressed out because of the world and there's so much pressure from social media. Not only do you have to be popular in your high school, you have to be popular in every high school because all of them are connected by Instagram. And so everyone is so stressed and have, has so much anxiety. Are they gonna have a job, politics, the world, climate change? It'll be okay. Like, we had the same problems when I was growing up. Uh, it'll be fine, you know, like just every day. be a part of the change and make a difference. Uh, I really wouldn't want people to give up and, and not try, not see that there's hope in the future. The, the future is going to be crazy, and I, and I hope I'm around to see it. Yeah, and just to add to that, you don't need to be Mark Zuckerberg. You do not have to define success uh, for yourself by a certain age. In fact, most people have amazing careers, and they find their stride after 40, 50, 60. Keep going. So do not give yourself a timeline and make yourself feel like a failure because you have just turned 30 or 35 and feel like you didn't achieve a success. Keep going because life is a long marathon. Yeah. I strongly support Alexis on his uh, statement. I think uh, having coding skills is super important. I code my first uh, products and uh, first couple of startups, I was uh, the main uh, developer and engineer for the company. And I know that in this room there are many startups and entrepreneurs there, or to be entrepreneurs. And I believe uh, coding skills will be super important for you guys. Because it's hard to find good engineers anyway, and it's going very expensive either. So if you want to lower the barrier to entry and create your minimum viable product, like a small product, I think you should probably learn coding, uh, at least you should understand how to do that to hire the best engineers. Uh, talking about myself, uh, it's also kind of similar to Alex, uh, I would say take it easy. When you are starting, uh, when, uh, when I was starting my first company, I didn't realize how much stress would be down the, the road, but you should enjoy the journey. You should enjoy the journey and you should enjoy even more than the outcome. because. 
you are going to have lots of stress. And when it's stress, you should take it easy because even if it's the worst day in your life, you think like this, uh, you know, like it's the end of your startup, you are just closing the door, there will be another day and then you can uh, regain and you can have another success. Very good. my younger self, I don't really live my life with regrets. I think we all do stupid things when we're young, but I think I just echo the sentiment of everybody else. It's just, it's, we're all going to make mistakes, so just don't be hard on yourself. And how we were talking earlier about winging it in life, you know, I'm 38, I started law school at 37. It's, it's really never too late to, to do what you want to do, and you can do anything that you really want to do. So, like, have fun in those mistakes that you're making. Make sure that they're worth it, and have fun in life, and wing it a little bit. Wing it is the lesson. Next, I'm going to ask a question that I was asked when I spoke at the Commonwealth Club. And maybe it's my most favorite question of all of my speaking engagements. And that is, if you could come up with just one idea to change the world, just one idea, and it can be completely fantasy, fantastic, meaning fantasy. It doesn't have to be based in reality. What would it be? And before I ask my panel, I'll tell you what I said. I was just asked this and I was given 30 seconds to come up with something or 30 seconds to give my answer. And I thought and I said one idea that I think would really change the world was if men could get pregnant and nurse babies. If that could happen, the world would be a very different place. So with that, I'd love to hear what you all one idea, and it can be total blue sky, it doesn't have to be based in reality, that um, that you, you would like to change the world? Wow. Well, mine was just, when I was, if something just comes off the top of my head, I mean, I would just, mine was thinking more of U.S. because we have the worst prison system in the world, so if I could get rid of most of prisons, if I'm just talking about wish and, and have rehab centers and mental health institutions that would house people that really need it, I think that would change a lot in the U.S. Thank you for saying that. And you know, I do believe it would change, the, change it all over the world because what happens when you come out of prison? You basically have been in an environment that hasn't prepared you for life after prison. So thank you for your work, Kim. And thank you for saying that. My team also technology related. So I wish uh, the visual storytelling we can ask natural uh, writing and even be like connected to your brain. So the way you visualize in your brain, you can easily create an image and show to the world. Because that's, we have a lots of things here and ability to convert this to the visual story will be the, the best things you can, you can have in your, in your life, I guess. Actually, I can actually project the, the gift and my mom can see it and she knows exactly what I feel for her. Thank you. Uh, that's, like, uh, that's like a very deep and question that has a lot of responsibility to it. No <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, no pressure. I, you can sit it out if you want. No, 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 like, this is, like, you can't sit this one out. Like, you have to be a part of the solution, right? So, for me, you know, if, if you're gonna, if you're gonna give me that, it has to be about poverty, right? And it has to be about freedom of people. And I think, I think it's the, the, it's not actually, I don't actually think technology is gonna solve any of that. What's gonna solve it is a financial system that's not capitalism. It's gonna be a social system that's not built around how we, we, we idolize some of the institutions that we have now. We need a new 
form of government that is a global government that's going to allow technology and other things to happen, but without oppressing people around the world. You know, half the people in the world aren't going to be watching this because they don't have access to the internet. So how do we bring all of those people back into what we are, we're doing here? And I think the, the change is not going to come from the technologists. It's going to come from governments. So the, the invention that I would invent is a new type of government, if I could. Jeez. Uh, okay. Well, the one that my mind went to is not as not as big as I hoped it would be. But um, I think all of my success as an entrepreneur, an investor, uh, friend, husband, son, all of those things. I mean, there have been plenty of failures too. But but when it has worked, has been because of um, uh, an understanding of a. Of a empathy, and if I could truly feel, if anyone could truly feel how another person feels, maybe this solves the, the, the male misunderstanding around pregnancy and all of that responsibility and pressure and, and awesomeness that it confers on a woman who is pregnant. Um, but maybe it also helps us better understand the people whose lives are ruined by our appropriate prison system. People who who are who truly know fear and pain and helplessness because they are left out of the economic system. Um, maybe that helps us better understand one another if we can really, really deeply, just magically empathize um, and feel literally feel someone's pain when they're hurt. Um, I know I like all the times that I have screwed up have usually stemmed from not understanding that whether that's been with my, my wife or whether that's been with uh, a company. And, and those are also the areas where I've learned the most, in part because I hurt from knowing that, that pain of not understanding. And, and when I got close to feeling what they felt um, is where I found the most growth myself. Just like when I'm at the gym and I'm pushing some extra weight and it hurts a little, like that is where growth comes from, from that pain. Two minutes left, so very little time. This has been a very fun session. So before we leave each other, what I would love to hear from you is back to the entrepreneur, back to wing business, and the one business that you wish you could have done out there, the one that got away. You know, sometimes you look at a company and say, gosh, that's such a great idea, or you look at a product and say, gosh, that's such a great idea. I wish I had done it. And real rapid succession because we don't have much time. Who's going to jump in first? I mean, there's so many, right? Like inventing a computer and everything. I don't know. Instagram. There's so many. One of their companies. Kim, you're very, 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 very interesting. How about that? When I watched Steve Jobs introducing iPhone, I was thinking, wow. This thing is going to change the world. And that, it, it really does. And this is probably the biggest invention which happened in my, in my lifetime, which changed the life of so many people. I wish I was that guy. <laughs> It's not a little weird, but I think the greatest invention that I wish I could have done is the postal service. Uh, before the internet, you know, for thousands of years, people have been able to communicate globally through this decentralized network that could withstand wars and famine. And you can take a piece of paper and deliver it to anyone in the world within a few days. And all the governments are backing this. This is like a very public good. Uh, the United States backs it with government money. The entire postal service is, the, is, I think, still by far the most interesting network of communication ever built. I think it'll probably outlast the internet. Uh, so if I could have worked on that, that would have been great. And Alex? Uh, I mean, there is a laundry list of companies I wish I had invested in that I missed. I, I, the thing that I got to live a little vicariously through, thanks to social media and all of you, was the revolution. And I know it's not a company, but I am my seat excited and so proud and so amazed, and I wish I could say that I actually had a role in it. I had none, aside from a few retweets. 
but um, but that it just it, it, it's that is it. Very good. Um, well, thank you very much for being such an amazing audience. I want to also thank all my panelists. It's not every day that you get to sit on a panel with someone who has a quarter of a billion followers. So thank you for agreeing to be part of this panel. And Kim, specifically for you, thank you for making the trip all the way out to Armenia to be part of this. Thank you, everybody. And thank you very much.